Kentucky State Police files to the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, many, many attorneys' notes from previous civil trials. And nothing seemed to make sense. Um, nothing that I read in the Kentucky State Police file seemed to be making any sense as to uh, a connection with what I was reading in the newspapers. I could see that something terribly was wrong, but I, I, I didn't have an answer at that, at that time, of course. Um, I want to let you know that uh, this is just the facts. Uh, this is not my opinion. Uh, this is not the opinion of uh, the former employee that I mentioned before. Uh, we went through hundreds of legal depositions, uh, personal interviews. Uh, there were files uh, that the state police had put together by uh, of everyone that was there, uh, interviews with uh, you know where they were at the, at the time that the fire broke out, where were they seated, what room were they in. You know, we we went through all of that information and uh, basically uh, put all of that into the book. I decided very early if I was going to do a history of the Beverly Hills Supper Club, I had to talk a little bit about the history of Newport in general. How many people are, are from the, the area or at least familiar with Newport's history? Okay, so um, I think it's important, especially when we're talking to new generations that are coming along and have no idea what the Beverly Hills Club was and, and, and no idea of Newport's past, but I think it's very important. Uh, a lot of people think of uh, the early Sin City reputation as going back to the, uh, the, the 40s or 50s or the 30s, and it actually goes way back to even the, uh, the late 1800s. Um, Newport was uh, known at that time uh, for some of the illegal activities. Uh, the Newport barracks came along, uh, military installation. Uh, immediately there was prostitution in, in, uh, in Newport. Uh, church festivals and lotteries uh, brought some of the uh, early forms of gambling into the area. There were actually slot machines in Newport before 1900. Um, and very quickly, gambling and drinking um, was just looked at as normal activity in this, in this region. Uh, prohibition came along, uh, Andrew Volstead, the Volstead Act, uh, with the prohibition of the sale and distribution of, uh, of alcohol. It's really what brought in uh, the, the biggest crime and corruption to the region. Uh, George Remus, uh, known as the bootlegging king, uh, was a uh, had uh, degrees in law and and, uh, and pharmaceuticals. Um, realized very early that uh, medicinal alcohol was perfectly legal, so that's where he went. Uh, he actually bought out uh, several factories and uh, distributed what he considered uh, medicinal alcohol. Uh, he hired twelve, as he called them, lieutenants. And uh, what he was actually doing was supplying illegal alcohol to the entire Midwest. Uh, you see here, he was making two and a half million dollars in the first three months. This is again back in the 20s. Uh, he originated the payoff. Uh, he's the first person we know of uh, nationwide that would pay off the, uh, the sheriffs and the, and, uh, the local authorities uh, so that he could run his operation. Uh, it didn't work perfectly. As you can see, the picture we have is a mug shop. So it wasn't great at what he did. but. His 12 lieutenants all went on to fame and fortune here in the, in the, uh, the area. Peach Mint was one, uh, opened the Glenn Hotel in Newport. Uh, Jimmy Brink was another who opened the Lookout House over in Kenton County. Buck Brady, uh, Bluegrass Inn, and other clubs started opening, um, all catering to this uh, illegal alcohol. And once Prohibition was over, uh, they all switched to illegal gambling. Uh, the Mafia certainly heard about that pretty quickly. Uh, they found out that uh, Newport was, in, in Cincinnati in general, was uh, sort of a wide open market. Uh, the, uh, the Cleveland Syndicate sent in um, some people of uh, their own, uh, headed by Mo Delitz. Um, he was part of the uh, Little Jewish Navy. Uh, he formed what became the Cleveland Four with Sam Tucker, Morris Kleinman, and Lou Rothkopf. And they pretty much took over Newport uh, at that time. Uh, Newport in the 1930s, several clubs were already su uh, successful. Uh, the Mafia hears Newport's wide open. Uh, Cleveland sends in Mo Delitz. Uh, New York Syndicate sing sends in the Levinson brothers. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Louis Levinson. Uh, had the nickname of Sleep Out Louis. Uh, he loved to uh, engage in all night poker games, but uh, he was so popular and so powerful that uh, he was allowed to sleep out a few hands if he wanted to. And uh, Meyer Lansking, Bugsy Siegel, uh, all very familiar names with uh, the early gambling era of Newport. This is, of course, before Las Vegas existed. Many of these names are familiar with the history of Las Vegas. 
Well, the Mafia came into Northern Kentucky, the Levinsons take over the Arrowhead Club. I say take over because they killed the owner and, and uh, said, this is our club now. Uh, the Cleveland Mob took over the Coney Island racetrack, same way. And then they uh, targeted Pete Schmidt's Glen Hotel. Well, Pete was very well known in the area and uh, they knew that uh, they couldn't just uh, knock him off. People wouldn't notice, I guess. So they started doing uh, many, many things to harass him. One included uh, what was called ding donging. Uh, the henchmen would simply go into the lobby of the Glen Hotel and urinate on the floor day after day after day. Um, Pete Schmidt finally sold the club to the Cleveland Syndicate uh, when he found uh, rig dynamite in the basement of his home. Uh, he decided to move out of Newport and uh, let the, the Mafia have that city. Uh, he went out to Southgate and uh, took over what was a vacant um, old speakeasy called the King Tuck Castle. He turned that into the first Beverly Hills Club. Uh, it became the first of what we know as carpet joints. All the other places in Newport were just dives. They were converted back rooms or basements or uh, second floors to these bars and you could get buzzed into a secret room uh, to do the gambling and drinking. But uh, the Beverly Hills Club was wide open. Uh, everyone knew it was there. Everyone knew it was illegal. Um, they had chandeliers on the ceiling. I mean, it, it was a totally different place. Carpet on the floor, hence the name Carpet Joint. Uh, very quickly, the classiest place in the region. The Mafia wanted it uh, very badly. On February 3rd, 1936, um, they went in and burned the place down because Pete Schmidt would not sell it. Uh, this was not unusual with these clubs at that time. This one would have been completely unnoticed, but uh, a five-year-old a uh, girl that was uh, the niece of the caretakers just happened to be in the building and she died in the fire. So public outcry demanded justice. Uh, there was an investigation and several of the mobsters were convicted. Red Masterson, uh, who was probably the ringleader, walked free. And Pete Schmidt uh, had a choice. He could uh, get out of the gambling business, was, which was the mob's suggestion uh, to him. But he, uh, he did not do that. Uh, he revamped the club, uh, remodeled the club, and changed the name to the Beverly Hills Country Club. This is one of the only color pictures, uh, it's actually a postcard uh, of uh, the original Beverly Hills Country Club. Well, Moe DeLeeds and his Cleveland Four continued to the, her the harassment, they continued ding-donging, they started roughing up customers, they actually robbed the payroll twice, no masks or anything, but no one could identify the culprits. And uh, we mentioned the dynamite. So Schmidt finally sells the club to the Cleveland Syndicate. Uh, Sam Schrader and Sam Tucker, again two of uh, Remus's henchmen, were put in charge. Uh, in 1940, uh, according to the deeds that we have copies of, the Cleveland Syndicate owned the club. More than 40 illegal casinos were operating in the area, none compared to the Beverly Hills. Top-notch entertainment, which we'll talk about here shortly, and gourmet dining. And maybe more importantly uh, than anything else, they had fair games, not fixed. Uh, most places down in Newport, uh, you couldn't possibly win. If you were lucky enough to actually win some money, you walked outside and you would get rough, roughed up and robbed, and the, the owners would actually take your money back. And you could not go to the police. Why could you not go to the police? Because they were paid off by the mob. This is the original uh, Trianon room in the, uh, the Supper Club, uh, held 500 and uh, very, very high posh uh, atmosphere there. The main bar seated 50 around the bar and another 50 in the room. The staff of the Beverly Hills, there's only over 200 people here. Uh, again, the staff down in the other clubs might be four or five people and the showgirls were not very pretty and the waiting staff was not very effective, but all top-notch people here. Some of the entertainers, uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, Marilyn Monroe, these are some of the people that would have graced the stage of the Trianon Room back in the heyday of the uh, Beverly Hills Country Club. The 40s to the 60s, uh, the mob expands. They force Jimmy Brink out of the uh, lookout house. Uh, the mafia takes ownership of the Yorkshire, Tropicana, Flamingo, Guys and Dolls. I mean, most of you recognize these names. All of these were, were run by the Cleveland Syndicate. Every now and again, uh, a group of, uh, we'll call them do-gooders, moved into the area deciding that uh, crime and prostitution and gambling was not good for the region. They wanted it uh, gone. And it never worked because uh, the mob would always hear about uh, 
they would hear ahead of time if any police raids were going to take place and they would simply hide all the gambling and paraphernalia and most of the local police didn't care anyway. But uh, a group uh, later named the Committee of 500 was organized, mostly by uh, Fort Thomas residents, not Newport. But they came in and they put George Ratterman on the ticket for sheriff. He was well known in the area, a former uh, football player for uh, Cleveland Browns, uh, very well known. He, he told everyone that he could not be bribed by the, the mob. Well, Charles Lester and Tito Carinci spearheaded a plan to disgrace him. Uh, they actually drugged him, uh, put him in bed with one of the known showgirls. Uh, the police just happened to be there to take pictures. I don't know how they were tipped off. But uh, he's, uh, you know, national news now. We've got this do good sheriff in bed with one of the showgirls. Uh, but the blood tests clearly show that he had, had been drugged. Uh, it hit the fan, as people say. Many were arrested, uh, police officers, police chiefs. Uh, well, a lot of those people were acquitted. Uh, gambling, the illegal gambling as we know it, was, was gone from Newport. Most people thought the mob left as well. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. But uh, Newport became a ghost town. Traditional businesses closed. Uh, vacant shops and storefronts were everywhere. Most of the store owners that I talked to told me that uh, they did not want the Committee of 500 moving in. They wanted the crime and corruption because business was good when they were there. Some places were open 24 hours a day just to handle all the traffic coming from uh, the Beverly Hills and the other places. Well, the Cleveland mob, most of them moved to Las Vegas and the Caribbean, but off-track betting still was a billion-dollar business in Newport. You could go into any of these clubs and, and again, get buzzed into that back room and place bets on horse, race, uh, horse races all over the country. A new list of major players, and we won't run down that list, but some of the more popular names, Sammy Eisner, Screw Andrews, uh, Buck Llewellyn, these are all people that uh, in the 60s and 70s were kind of running the show in Newport. And a new mafia enters the town. Uh, most people remember Newport in the 70s as the, the porn shops, the adult theaters. Uh, those were not private run uh, companies and businesses. Those were all paying a share of the money to the New York syndicate. And Cleveland stronghold still was the, the gambling with the, uh, the horse racing and things of that nature. If there was a glimmer of hope, it was Richard Schilling that came in in 1969 and purchased the old uh, country club, uh, did $2 million in renovations. Mob threats began immediately, and on June 21, 1970, the place burned down. Most people don't remember that. Uh, it was determined arson, uh, but I say police still being paid off question mark because the local police uh, filed their report and uh, said that they were uh, seven fires uh, burning at the same time when they first arrived. The two doors had been broken down. Uh, the electric and gas had been shut off during renovations. But the state police came in and said that uh, they could not determine any cause. <laughs> That's with uh, pictures like this one of uh, <coughs> gasoline cans found in the rubble that uh, did not belong to any of the workers. But uh, the Kentucky State Police couldn't figure that out. Well, Richard Schilling was given a choice. He could get out of the entertainment business, which was the mob's suggestion. Uh, but he decided not to do that. He expanded the place, uh, changed the name to the Beverly Hills Supper Club, and uh, actually built on some new rooms, uh, including the Cabaret Room, which had a capacity of 1,000 patrons, which was the largest of its kind in the entire Midwest. But the threats continued. Here's a picture of the uh, revamped outside. The garden area, which uh, was host to many weddings over the years. This was the crystal rooms on the second floor. Another shot of the garden area, garden rooms. Part of the garden rooms had uh, glass walls and glass ceilings so you could eat it uh, under the starlight. Uh, this was the main dining room. And the old Trianon room, uh, they turned into what was called the Empire Room. But it was no longer the main show, and this was used for uh, high school proms and weddings. Uh, you could have a live band there and things, but uh, the cabaret room became the new showroom. Got a lot of the 1970s decor, <laughs> wood paneling everywhere. And then this was the cabaret room, much larger stage, and again, seated 1,000. Well, I call the decade of the 70s the decade of violence, the Galaxy Club, the Lookout House. These are all places that burn down in, in arson or suspicious fires. 
uh, gangster killings were pretty commonplace. And the police corruption continues, I say, because uh, very few of these were ever investigated thoroughly. More of the list. Uh, former Governor, Governor Breathitt came forward saying that the Cleveland mob uh, uh, threatened him uh, with bodily harm. Uh, he was going to outlaw pinball machines as a form of entertainment and a form of gambling, um, and uh, they told him not to do that. <laughs> I guess he listened because it, it was never, never done. Uh, Greater Cincinnati Airport Terminal had an arson fire as well. Uh, unfortunately, two airport firefighters were killed in that fire. Changes in Cleveland. Uh, the Cleveland Syndicate became far more violent than they, they used to be in, in recent years. And I say, why is all of this important? Well, I want to make sure we're talking about uh, Northern Kentucky. This is not the 20s through the 40s. It's not uh, New York or Chicago. There were 45 car bombings, 60 murders, and 40 arson or suspicious fires in nightclubs in the greater Cincinnati area in the 1960s and 70s. Back in the Beverly Hills, business was better than ever. Uh, a 500-room hotel and convention center was planned. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were bulldozers on the property uh, the night of the fire. Uh, they were clearing uh, land for that expansion. More rumors uh, from uh, employees that I interviewed that the mob went into the place bad. And uh, a couple of employees said uh, that they heard uh, people come in and say, if you don't sell us this place, you may not have a place to sell. It became clear to a lot of people that the Beverly Hills was going to be torched, but uh, no one knew when. Well, May 28, 1977, a uh, beautiful uh, summer afternoon, uh, nice weather, uh, warm. The Roadrunners Club uh, had uh, come up from the uh, Ashland, Kentucky area with uh, two Greyhound buses full, mostly uh, senior citizens on what was their big event of the year. Uh, bar mitzvah going on, there was a small intimate uh, dinner uh, party for some doctors and their wives. Four separate weddings going on at the Beverly Hills that night. Uh, the Dave Auto Club, retirement parties, other anniversaries, birthdays, and of course a lot of people were just there for a private dinner. But about uh, 2,500 patrons and employees were expected to be in the club that night. Uh, early afternoon, David Brock, uh, one of the 16-year-old <coughs> busboys, enters the zebra room. He sees maintenance workers on ladders. Several employees later reported witnessing these people. A reservationist saw uh, unknown workers in the basement uh, earlier in the week as well as that morning. And one waitress sees an unknown group cleaning the walls that uh, led from the uh, from the club down to the cabaret room. There's nothing that in the Kentucky State Police files that uh, show that they investigated any of these what would be considered suspicious activities. From 5.30 to 8.30 p.m., several guests in the zebra room hear muffled blasts coming from within the walls or from the basement. They complain to staff that the room is too hot. Patrons in the main bar and crystal rooms uh, later tell investigators they smell smoke in the club at this time. And I should underline this or capitalize this. People coming up the driveway later reported they had seen smoke coming from the roof of the building when they arrived. Many witnesses as early as 5.45 p.m. And there were over a dozen people that later told investigators they saw smoke coming from the building. No one reported this to club staff. <coughs> In the cabaret room, uh, backstage, John Davidson, who was the main liner for the uh, evening, uh, was uh, actually shaving. Uh, on the stage was the comedy duo of Teeter and McDonald. They had just taken the stage. At uh, 8.58, uh, the Vandover sisters, two waitresses, uh, walk into the zebra room. They're looking for tray stands. Uh, the zebra room held a small wedding reception earlier, but by 8.30, these people were all gone. And they walk in, and they immediately see smoke whispering around the ceiling. Uh, Eileen Druckmann, the reservationist, also smells smoke at this time. Margie Schilling is informed, and she tells the telephone's authorities. Now, this was way before 911. She actually calls the Fort Thomas Police Department, uh, who in turn have to call and radio the other authorities. But very quickly, Newport, uh, Fort Thomas, and Southgate Fire Departments are responding, and staff begins a massive evacuation of the club. The main bar, the dining room, the empire rooms are first to vacate. It only takes a few minutes and there's about 600 people that are safe. Uh, all of these people were able to uh, exit through the front doors with very few exceptions. Uh, employees and owners try to extinguish the fire. Uh, a lot of witnesses, uh, well before any flames were noticed, uh, said that they saw employees running through the club with, uh, with fire extinguishers. 
I should point out there was no fire visible in the, the zero room at this time. The Viennese rooms are notified. The, uh, uh, the people there, about 135, quickly flee. But in the cabaret room, uh, no one has any idea that there's an emergency taking place. It's well on the, on the far side of the building. Here's a quick layout, and I don't know how close I can get to this thing. Uh, but uh, this is the front entrance here, through the foyer and into the main bar. Then you could come down past the spiral staircase that would have taken you upstairs. And then this is the long hallway that would take you down to the cabaret room. Uh, the Viennese room is here, uh, the uh, bar mitzvah and the dinner party for the doctors and their wives. The empire room is full of 500 people with a savings and loan group. Uh, and again, other groups elsewhere, but uh, the cabaret room was the main showroom. So one of the first uh, photographs that uh, shows smoke coming, coming from the building. Uh, you can't see from the back of the room, but the girl in front has a smile on her face. No one thinks that this is going to be much of a tragedy. Uh, they just want the small fire that's maybe in the kitchen to be put out so that they can go about their, their evening. On the second floor, there's about 200 people partying. Uh, most of the employees uh, lead those people down the spiral staircase and out the front door. Wayne Dameron, who is the banquet captain upstairs, uh, and several other employees uh, end up leading about 100 people through a back hallway once smoke comes up that main staircase. There are two people that were part of a fashion show that are in a dressing room. Uh, by the time they figure out what's going on, uh, it's too late to find their way out. They will not survive. This is one of the first color photographs. Um, the bright light is not uh, flames. Uh, that's just lights from the, the canopy there, but you can see this is what firefighters saw when they first arrived, smoke billowing out of the, um, the uh, parts of the, the roof, and they knew immediately that they had a, a serious situation on their hands. Fort Thomas and Southgate firefighters arrive around 904. They immediately call for additional departments. Firemen begin assessing the situation. They start running hose lines. Most at this time are assisting with the evacuation. Uh, I talked to a couple of firefighters that, uh, that told me as they pulled up the driveway, there were so many people standing at the top of the driveway, they said, oh, thank God, everyone got out okay. It still does not look like there's any casualties. There's a lot of people that are uh, overcome. That uh, There's plenty of club staff and, and uh, other patrons to help them. Again, that was before firefighters arrived. Uh, Walter Bailey is considered one of the dozens of heroes. He's, again, another 16-year-old uh, busboy. He finds out uh, through the grapevine that there's a fire in the zebra room. Well, he's in the cabaret room. He actually delays only about 45 seconds uh, what he's going to do. Uh, he's 16 years old. He knows that there's a 1,000 people in the cabaret room. They just ordered their drinks. They paid for fancy dinners. Should he go in and evacuate that room? He's not seen any smoke. He's not seen any flames. But uh, about 9.05, he steps onto the stage, takes the microphone from the comedy duo, and says, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? There's a small fire on the opposite side of the building. We ask that you please leave. You can go the, through the doors that, the, that you came through. There's also a, an emergency exit here. There's also an emergency exit there. And he leaves the stage. Unfortunately, most of the people were not paying any attention. Uh, some of the people that did pay attention thought he was actually part of the comedy routine because the handoff of the microphone went so smoothly, so they did not leave. Others had just sat down, they were talking with their family and friends that they hadn't seen for a while, they were not paying any attention. Only about one third of the room immediately gathered their belongings and started leaving. Of course, all of those people made it out safely with, with no problems at all. One of the shots from the back of the club is people are leaving through the, one of the emergency exits, and this is another emergency exit. This was on the east side, um, closer to the uh, to Highway 27. About 9:18, firefighters learn that there are people still in the cabaret room. There's still no fire there. All about five, all but about 500 people have escaped that room. Flames and smoke finally race down that long hallway. They finally break out of the zebra room and uh, cut off the, the main egress from the cabaret room. Uh, now people are forced through those two emergency exits. It's estimated that there were about 100 firefighters on the scene by 9.30. This is a shot from the uh, bottom of the hill, the main driveway. Um, flames coming out the roof. This is 
later, later in the evening, of course. And this is much later. <coughs> the problem in the cabaret room uh, was, uh, was two things. Uh, number one, it, uh, it was designed for a thousand people, but uh, it was very close quarters. But uh, the two emergency exits, again, the main hallway, the main uh, exit was, was blocked off pretty quickly in the event. Uh, the side hallway here was filled with smoke pretty early, um, and the only way out were two emergency exits at the, at the far ends. Um, fortunately, on this side, the uh, banquet captain was notified early enough that he could change these doors. They, on both sides, they were uh, called waiter doors. You've seen these where you, you can push on the right-hand door and it opens up. The left-hand door is made to open in, so you can push on it all day long. It's not going to open. But on, on this side, he was able to move both doors so that they moved outward. Um, everyone was able to move out of the cabaret room and into the hallway here, but once in the darkened hallway, they quickly became lost. Uh, some people went into the dressing room area, in the backstage area. Uh, many people turned left into what was a closet, and uh, there were 12 bodies found in the closet. And then uh, many people were no more than, than 10 feet away from the exit. Uh, and were overcome by smoke and, and perished there. On the other side, unfortunately, that it was much, much worse. The waiter door, doors were not reset, so you have, you know, 100 people or more trying to get out one small doorway, and of course, people started shoving and pushing. People walked up, pushed up against that door that would not open, and uh, they were overcome with smoke. They fell to the ground. People fell on top of them, on top of them, on top of them. Um, if they were able to make it out into the other hallway, that was not the exit. Uh, there was still a, a, a room to go through there. Many people got lost and disoriented. Uh, some people uh, were found behind the bar. Uh, some, again, turned into uh, uh, the, wrong, the wrong direction. And, uh, of course, quite a few uh, did make it out. Folks, I'll be honest with you, I had a very tough, difficult decision deciding which pictures to put in my book. But unfortunately, we live in a time now where I tell you 169 people were killed, and that doesn't seem to mean much. But seeing the beautiful garden area uh, littered with bodies is something that I think that uh, the younger generation needs to see. This is an event that we should never, ever forget. Uh, the beautiful chapel that became a triage center that night where uh, a lot of those nurses were put to, to work. This is a shot from the, the next morning, obviously, from helicopter. And for those that uh, are not familiar with the place, uh, just to give you an idea of the, the, the scope of the, the size of this place, this here is the cabaret room, which seated 1,000. You've got many other showrooms as well as a second floor uh, on, on part of the building. The Four Times Armory uh, was turned into a makeshift morgue. Over the next few days, uh, families came viewing body, uh, going body to body looking for loved ones. And the initial news releases, uh, it was uh, reported that there was a 20 minute delay before a look, um, anyone alerted the authorities. Uh, many fire exits were chained and locked. How many people remember? Locked fire exits, a few of you. Uh, they said nearly three times the capacity was in the cabaret room. There was no sprinkler system. Um, looking back on it, I, I think this was terrible reporting by newsmen that just wanted to be first. In the grand jury's investigation, all of these things were proven to be false. Now, there was no sprinkler system, but none was required by law at that time. The 20 minute delay, uh, we, we clearly know that uh, uh, the, uh, the authorities were called immediately. There were two uh, exits that were, were locked. Uh, one was upstairs that was simply a plywood door that led out onto the roof of the, the canopy. Uh, and luckily, no one broke through that door to get out because the firefighters were not able to, they didn't have any ladders set up or anything to get people off of the roof at that time. So luckily, they waited and went through the, the, the stairway down and through the kitchen. And uh, the other one was in the uh, Empire, the uh, Viennese room which uh, through remodeling was not visible on the inside, was only visible on the outside, number one. Number two, the people in the cabaret room would have, have to have gone through the fire to get to that exit. But it was reported that there was a fire exit chain and lock. Well, there was, I guess. 
uh, Governor Carroll uh, quickly took charge of the investigation. Uh, I know he's a governor, not an investigator, but he took charge. Uh, the Kentucky State Police quickly reported that the fire started in or near the zebra room. It was, they found major electrical problems to the building. They actually said that the, the shillings were negligent and should be indicted for murder. Uh, bull, they began bulldozing on Monday. I'll repeat that. The fire was Saturday night and the uh, Governor Carroll ordered uh, bulldozing on Monday afternoon. They found several code violations, including the locked doors, the overcrowding, the 20-minute delay. They also said that there was no fire in the basement. I'll underline that. We'll come back to that. Kentucky State Police had no fire in the basement. There was a grand jury that was uh, uh, put in place to, to look at the shillings to see if there was enough evidence to indict them for anything. And I think a lot of the people in this, in this region were dumbfounded when their report came out saying that there was no uh, overcrowding. There were no deaths due to code violation. There was no delay in reporting the fire, and they found no negligence at the hands of the owners. They actually gave, gave great praise to the staff for being able to evacuate more than 2,300 patrons and employees. They also said the fire started somewhere near the, re the zebra room was most likely electrical in nature, but because part of the building had been bulldozed, uh, they, they could come up with no better definition than that. Officially, yeah, still today, uh, the fire was somewhere near the zebra room, was most likely electrical, and numerous code violations led to a high death toll. The Kentucky State Police have no mention of the witnesses that the workers saw earlier in the day. They have no evidence of fire in the basement, and they see no sign of arson. Stan Chesley was one of the uh, few attorneys that would step forward and look at a civil trial possibility. Um, he knew uh, well in advance that he could not prove exactly how the fire started or why so many people died. So he decided to sue everyone. Uh, this became uh, the first class action lawsuit of its kind. He en ended up going into three phases because there were 1,151 people named as uh, defendants. Phase one, he took on the aluminum wiring company, uh, companies. Uh, he actually lost uh, that uh, case. He took on the PVC companies. He was going to prove that there was so much plastic in the uh, carpeting, draperies, uh, the plastic burning is what emitted the toxic smoke. That's what killed people. Um, he didn't win that case either. He went after the products uh, companies. That if you simply uh, provided cloth napkins to the Beverly Hills Supper Club, you were indicted. He was going to prove that the smoke, the, the, the burning napkins, uh, that's what killed everyone. Well, he lost that case as well. Now, it's very important to know that most of these companies that were involved have insurance policies. Uh, most started paying out-of-court settlements. They did not want to go to court. If they had a million dollar policy, they offered Stan 500000 he countered, they countered, and he was collecting millions of dollars while this was all going on. He was able to uh, launch a retrial of the aluminum wiring companies because of a, a jury, some jury misconduct, uh, which is in the book, but it's just too much to go into right now. But uh, incredibly, the question put to the jury was changed in the retrial. In the original trial, they asked specifically, could aluminum wiring uh, was, was aluminum wiring uh, the cause of the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire? And they quickly said no. There was not enough proof to show that. Uh, secondly, uh, in the retrial, they were asked, could a binding screw connecting aluminum wiring with copper wiring play a significant role in a fire? Well, they had to say yes. It could, could have been a binding screw. It could have been a toppled candle. It could have been a lit cigarette. It could have been arson. But he and actually won the case. Uh, at that time, only General Electric was the, the only company left. Uh, everyone else uh, had, had settled out of court, and uh, he, he did win that trial. Most people today remember Stan Chesley as winning millions of dollars for the victims and their families, uh, when he, in, in reality, he didn't really win much of the case at all. But he did collect uh, millions. Um, it's estimated that it was about 53 million uh, was collected, and about half of that went to the victims and their families. Uh, the rest went to him and his uh, attorney staff. David Brock, we mentioned before, the 16-year-old bus boy. Um, several months after the fire, he went to the owners and said, uh, has anyone ever questioned those maintenance workers that were in the zebra room? And Mr. Schilling said, what are you talking about? You mean uh, like uh, six months before the fire? And he said, no, they were there the day of the fire. Well, what were they doing, Dave? Dave said, well, they told me they were working on the air conditioning units. 
And Mr. Shemin said, well, um, there are no air conditioning units in the ceiling of the Zebra Room. So we actually, uh, all of the Shemin's paperwork uh, was kept at, at his home. We went through that. There's nothing, there's no record of any maintenance work is being hired to do any work uh, the way that the uh, Beverly Hills burned down. Uh, Dave kept quiet for 25 years, but at the 30 year anniversary, he realized uh, that there were other witnesses that saw the same people he saw. He, he thought he was the only one that saw them. He went to the Kentucky State Police with what he knew, and uh, they gave him no help at all. And again, that's a long story that's in the book that we don't have time to get into. Uh, it's in the newspapers that uh, the Kentucky State Police uh, looked at this as, possible, uh, as a possibility of reopening the investigation, but I can tell you they did not. So he uh, formed his own team. He contacted me, of course, uh, a local history author and researcher. A uh, close friend of him, Tom McConaughey, went through thousands and thousands of papers. We also, uh, thank goodness, got, the whole, uh, got a hold of Glenn Corbett, who was a world-renowned fire science expert, uh, still professor at John Jay College of Fire Science in New York. Rodney Raby was Kentucky State Fire Marshal twice, uh, looked through all the investigation materials that we had. Uh, Pete Sabino was a retired captain with Cincinnati Fire Department. Uh, Rodney Raby and Glenn Corbett especially uh, very quickly uh, determined that something was terribly wrong in the, the initial investigation, and clearly the fire was not started by a woman in Warren. In the reinvestigation, we went through all the files from the Kentucky State Police, the National Fire Protection Association, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the FBI, at 600 pages. And it was on an arson file, by the way, uh, that we looked through. Uh, over, but there's no arson. Uh, over five years of in-depth research and numerous interviews, incredibly, the most damaging evidence came from the original Kentucky State Police files. Are you sitting down? <laughs> The Kentucky State Fire Marshal's division was not allowed in the basement after Monday. By order of Governor Carroll, they were no longer permitted there. As a matter of fact, he told them to go back to Frankfurt. What they determined before they were kicked out was that the basement was the major concentration point for the fire. There was evidence of tampering throughout the basement. They found timers in the rubble. Some were set on AM, some were set on PM. They, can, they uh, determined very quickly that the fire started in an air conditioning unit below the zebra room in conjunction with a breaker box located there and that the fire moved into the walls and up into the ceiling of the second floor before burning through the walls and becoming uh, where it could be discovered. There were explosions and tampering of equipment in the basement. There were heavy V patterns in the basement, even though the, FBI, the Kentucky State Police say there's no signs of major fire there. The evidence uh, shows that the fire burned down into the zebra room and hallway, and clear evidence that the fire started in the basement. Now, these photographs are nowhere to be found. I will back up a second. Uh, Ronald, Ronnie Friels, we determined, was the Kentucky State Police Trooper that took most of the pictures. And I won't say mm, how we did this, but uh, we may have misrepresented ourselves uh, to Mr. Friels. Uh, when, uh, and found out that he had uh, a nice private collection of photographs in his home that he was glad to uh, give us a slideshow presentation of. Luckily, we took our camera and took some pictures of his pictures because once he found out who we were, uh, that, uh, that went away. And we still have a lawsuit against the state police uh, for access to these photographs. But here is a picture that he showed us of the air conditioning unit that exploded below the zebra room. The uh, motor was found about 20 feet away. Um, some of the V patterns in the basement below the zebra room. This was what we call a uh, void space uh, that led from that area in the basement all the way to the ceiling of the second floor and worked really like a chimney. And this was the major concentration of the, of the worst part of the fire. Uh, on the left, you'll see some of the tampering. These are wires that uh, don't have a plug on them. They were stripped and stuck in there, and they were run over to that air con conditioning unit where uh, the timers were, were found. Evidence of the downward uh, fire. Um, by the way, this is one of the electrical outlets that uh, Stan Chesley says uh, was filled with aluminum wiring and caused the fire. You can see there's no damage to it at all. But the fire clearly burned from the ceiling down. This is up the wall of the zebra room. And this is a wall of that main hallway that led down to the cabaret room. No damage to the bottom of the, the wall. All the damage came from the ceiling down. 
The summary of the new investigation, uh, there's no physical evidence whatsoever to indicate faulty aluminum wiring. As a matter of fact, aluminum wiring wasn't mentioned in the investigation in, until the civil suits came along. Uh, there were some minor code violations. Uh, no deaths occurred as a result of those violations. Nearly a dozen witnesses had told authorities immediately after the fire about suspicious activities they had seen. None of those made the official report. Most initial investigators, including the Kentucky State Fire Marshals, pointed to the basement. Some of those investigators were kept from going downstairs. There's clear cover-up and, and uh, conspiracy, in, in our opinion, involving Governor Carroll and the Kentucky State Police. And the fire clearly spread from the basement, within the walls, and into the ceilings, and then down from above. All of the physical evidence that we can locate uh, points to arson. <coughs> The state of Kentucky still has no permanent memorial on one of the nation's worst tragedies. Again, 169 people were killed. Uh, this is a monument that uh, some volunteers have put together on the site uh, that you can see if you're driving uh, south on 471 at uh, the Route 27 interchange. And uh, folks, I will mention that uh, there is a History Day special today. Uh, the hard cover, the original edition hardcover book, which sold for forty-five dollars, uh, is uh, available at the uh, Kenton County Historical Society's booth, as well as a table over here, and they are thirty dollars today. And folks, I'm open for a few questions. We have some time, and I've been told you're not allowed to leave unless there's at least five questions. So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you ever feel in danger yourself for? Uh, telling this information so do you, publicly? Do you have a gun? <laughs> no, that's, that's a very common question and I'll tell you, there were things that I found out early in the investigation uh, that caused my wife and I both to get our concealed carry permits. Uh, there was a, a stretch of about a, a year uh, that was not pleasant. Um, uh, you could write movies about I suppose. I, I remember leaving the house one day and telling my wife, you know, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be going. The gentleman wanted to meet me under the uh, railroad bridge that led from Covington to Ludlow. And I, I, she said, are you going? I said, yes, I'm, I have to. I have to see what he has. Uh, he really didn't tell me anything I didn't know. Uh, I had a two-hour interview with a gentleman one time, and I came up from the off, my office, and my wife said, who were you on the phone with so long? And I said, Henry Hill. Why does that name sound familiar? I said, well, did you see the movie Goodfellas? He's the, the guy that uh, was put in the witness protection program from the, the New York Mafia. Oh, yeah. Well, I found out that, and this is another little history bit, but uh, he was not very good at keeping his mouth closed. Obviously, he was one of the biggest snitches ever discovered in the mob. But uh, his third location of being relocated uh, was to Independence, Kentucky in 1978. So I thought maybe he had something that he could tell me. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't. But uh, he he had planned to tell me this. He would not shut up. So, but uh, at any rate, uh, yeah. I, now today, no. I, I think that uh, most of the people that I name in the book as being uh, part of this uh, conspiracy, and especially the people that I, that we think actually set the fire, are all deceased. Uh, that's one of the reasons I don't think the the case will ever be reopened. Uh, besides the fact that the, the Kentucky State Police would have to admit wrongdoing. Yes, ma'am. Has um, anybody really followed up with investigating the governor and his ties with this? Well, um, I didn't get to interviewing myself, but uh, David Brock uh, and Tom McConaughey did. Uh, they went out, we actually wanted to know specifically why he were the place bulldozed. So we asked him uh, in the hallway of the Capitol building. And uh, he said, I don't remember giving that order. And I said, well, we have a uh, signed affidavit by the Bolo's operator that said that you told him to Bolo's the property and get it level as quickly as you can. And he said, well, I don't remember when I gave that order. And I said, well, uh, here's a picture of you standing on the running board of the bulldozer. And he said, well, I don't remember when that was taken. I said, well, it was published in the Monday afternoon in Kentucky. He told us to get the, he asked us to leave. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we've asked for further interviews, but uh, incredibly, that hasn't happened. Yes, ma'am. I've heard a story that the <clears throat> photographer who took the sneaky pictures of Radovan, his grandmother was on the 500 committee, 
And he felt guilty, so he yeah. gave the information. Yeah, it's I, it's incredible the amount of uh, corruption that was going on back then. But um, uh, I mentioned, you know, briefly that it's it's incredible how the Kentucky State Police just have, or the, the Newport Police just happened to be there with cameras for, you know, in the hallway of the hotel. Yeah. There's a book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy. Yes. There's a whole lot of things that are being carol. Uh, absolutely. And, and I cover some of this in the book. Um, obviously, in 45 minutes, we can't cover everything. But there's a, a book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy, which uh, clearly shows that uh, there, there are seven Kentucky governors in a row that have been investigated for many, many things you, you would not believe. Um, it's hard to pin you know, something down with enough evidence to indict anyone, but, and people have asked me, do you really think Governor Carroll was, was a part of the mob, or was he getting paid off? And, you know, I don't have that evidence, so I, all I can show you is the evidence that I have, and you can make your own, you know, decision from that, but for him to actually give orders to bulldoze the property, he, he told someone else that uh, he was so mad at the shillings that he wanted to make sure they could never rebuild there, so let's bulldoze the property. Well, if I own the property and I want to rebuild, what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to bulldoze the property, get it all level so I can build the place. So, I, I don't know. Uh, he He's either involved in some way or he's an absolute idiot for bulldozing the, the crime scene less than 48 hours after the fire. Yes, sir. I got a story. No, I was up there. I lived right down the street from there on Brandy. And, uh, Matter of fact, the fire chief before Thomas lived next door to me. And we were out cutting the grass, and all of a sudden he wasn't there. And I asked his wife what happened to him, and she said, Beverly Hills is on fire. So they were, a few hours later, they, before we had bottled water back in the day, yeah. they were asking for water, and he had the drums and some of these big yeah. things that came out there. Well, I stayed there the whole time until we went up to the army and did fire. But that night, uh, the fire, I guess it been Sunday morning, uh, they had all the bodies laying on the hillside there. For the army trucks to come up, they couldn't get up the driveway. They had to come up the hill, so they had those six by six army trucks come up and take the bodies up to the armory. And they were all laying on the hillside. It's a true story. I we sitting there waiting, and here comes the snake right across the road, right across the top of the box. I'll never forget that box. Wow! Wow! What right? It, I guess it was a black snake, but it went right across the top of the box. That's incredible. That's incredible. It, it's amazing as I go out speaking that, you know, how many people have a personal connection. I mean, this is something, again, if there's some people here that's not from the, the area originally. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, like the Kennedy assassination. You remembered exactly what you were doing and where you were uh, when you first heard about this. Uh, I, I mentioned my personal story in the book uh, that I was, I lived next door to uh, uh, the ambulance driver for Covington. And, of course, their scanners were going off and, you know, I was 16, 17. They were knocking on my door. Beverly Hills is on fire. I'm like, well, I'm going to drive all the way over there. It'll be out by the time we get over there. No, no, they're calling for Covington to help. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's pretty unusual. Uh, we ended up walking up uh, Mock Road because they had it blocked off. And I tell people in the, the story, you know, we walked up that front hillside about halfway up, and and uh, there were five bodies uh, that had obviously had been laid there. And again, I have people tell me, no, there were no bodies on the front on the front of the building. Yeah, they were, they were moved around back later on. But uh, nothing like the movies. No uh, you know, smoke under their nose, no burnt clothes. Uh, they, they looked like they had just been laid there sleeping. One gentleman had a shoe missing, one lady had a shoe missing. Other than that, no sign of, of any tragedy whatsoever. And it took me a long time. I, I say a long time. It probably took a, a minute and a half, two minutes for me to realize because I remember saying why why are they laying here why don't they get up and move they're so close to it just doesn't sink in I thank God to this day that I didn't that we, we did not walk around to the back of the building I don't think I would ever ever be free um, yes ma'am what about David Brock the, the true hero 16 years old that was shot in has he looked back? Of course, you met him. Did uh, look back David Brock that, that discovered the, uh, the bus boy. The bus boy that, that saw the workers in the yes. building. Um, he he started. That, uh, the alert of the cabaret. Oh, no, Walter, Walter Bailey. Walter, Walter Bailey. Bailey. Uh, okay. Yeah, Walter. 16 years old. He uh, is still a dream to him. He tells me I've interviewed him several times. Uh, his his quote has sort of been misrepresented. He thinks, but. Uh, I talked to so many people that said, well, this is what he said when he was on the stage. So we put that together, that he was very concise, very clear on what to do. 
Uh, he doesn't see himself as a hero, but uh, you know, certainly if he would have hesitated another minute, or if he'd have decided, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to get fired by evacuating this building when I haven't even seen a fire, that certainly was an option for him. So he's certainly one of the many heroes. There were uh, many unsung heroes. Uh, I have, uh, you know, many reports from people in the dining room that said that, uh, and uh, and also the the, uh, the garden rooms that said that these waiters and waitresses did not leave. They did not leave their station until all of their their people were, they, that's what they call them. I, I was not going anywhere until my people were outside. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of heroes. Yes, sir. Are there any previous fires? Um, at the Beverly Hills? Yeah. Uh, some small fires, obviously the one we mentioned in, in before the place actually opened. Uh, there were some small fires, that, uh, um, also car fires in the parking lot. I mean, it was not uncommon for, for fire crews to go up there, but. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, Fort Thomas, uh, especially Fort Thomas, uh, I guess that's higher on the avenue. Uh, there's, there's a place where you can actually see part of the club and they can see smoke, uh, you know, giving them enough advance notice that this is this is not a typical small fire run. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you remember John Davidson got out, the singer, he got out with his musician, yeah. who went back in yeah. to get his music. Oh, there were several musicians that, uh, that died in the fire. Most of those were local musicians that were in the band. Uh, John Davidson was witnessed by many people actually holding that east emergency exit door open for quite a few, time, uh, quite a few minutes. Uh, but his musical arranger from California uh, did perish in the fire. Yes, yes sir. Is Davidson ever commented? Uh, Davidson was never, he did one interview that I'm aware of. Uh, and, the, and it was many years after the fire. Uh, his career was nothing uh, the same after that. Um, uh, he obviously, he was the, the gentleman that had to go to the Fort Thomas Army, Armory to identify his, his composer, arranger. But he was really never the same. Uh, if you talk to people that know him, just his demeanor overall was never the same after the fire. Someone else? Yeah, David. Uh, you have all this new evidence you just showed us up here. Uh, was this evidence presented to any law enforcement? If so, who did was it presented to? Well, and did they do it? Anything? Um, we took it to the uh, the Post Six uh, Kentucky State Police at one time, and according to this was the first time that we we brought it up, uh, and according to the uh, the trooper that was working the desk at that day, uh, she said uh, that uh, two. Two troopers from Frankfurt came up, wanted to see the, the box of evidence. Uh, they opened one of the lids, they took out one folder, they looked at it for less than 30 seconds. They said, let's go to lunch. And when they came back, they said, you put it all away. <coughs> that was the first look into the possibility of reinvestigation was about 30, 30 seconds. Um, we actually did take it to uh, Governor uh, Brashear. Um, he formed a committee. I'm excited. Let's put a committee together and we'll look at the possibility of reopening the investigation. As soon as I found, and who should be on the committee? I know who should be on the committee. Um, fire investigators, FBI, arson investigators, fire marshals. Um, the committee was made up of four attorneys. <laughs> Two of those worked on the original uh, investigation. And clearly, all they want to do was, can the state of Kentucky get in trouble if we reinvestigate this? Yes. So I was not surprised at all when 30 days later they said, and this is what's in the newspaper. There's no evidence worth investigating the, the, the separate club fire again. Well, they didn't, they didn't even look at it. Yes, sir? Was, it, was the motive for this? Uh, the motive was, was money, as always. Uh, the, the, the club was obviously extremely successful at that time. Uh, I mean, it was the, the peak of its career, really. Um, and uh, the uh, the property was was uh, was prime. Uh, uh, Interstate 471 was just being built. I should ask you, uh, what government official was in charge of deciding the route of, of Interstate 471? Carole. Governor Carroll. I know that's just a coincidence. <laughs> um, and whose property did it decide to go through? Was it Sam Schrader, who was at, at one time in charge of the Cleveland Syndicate? I, I know that's just a coincidence. 
But that's why Interstate 471 does what it does. Uh, but it was certainly going to be, you know, right there at the exit with, with Route 27, obviously more of a prime property than it is today. I know you mentioned the timers. Yeah. We said PM and AM. Yeah. So the theory was they were supposed to be AM. Yeah. The, 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 the team of investigators are really split 50-50. Some of them think that uh, this was a deliberate act uh, to cause the fire at that time. I'm not one of those. Uh, I think that the, the clear issue was that the fire was uh, supposed to start at 6 o'clock, uh, 6.30 Sunday morning. Uh, if you look back at the history of these nightclub fires, they were almost always were on a Sunday morning. Uh, but I think the intention was not to kill anyone, uh, to burn the place down on, on Sunday morning, not Saturday night. The two people that I name uh, that actually we feel actually set the fire, uh, those people blew themselves up uh, setting the fire in Covington about eight months later. So they were not very good at what they did. Uh, they set a fire in a warehouse on Pike Street in Covington, and when they opened the door to leave, kaboom. They were found down the bottom. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of the, the many that think that uh, the fire, the, the death toll was not intentional. Yes, sir. Didn't uh, Schilling's own the lookout house when it burnt? Before uh, the that's a common misconception. They owned the lookout house and brought great success to that place, but they sold that in 1971 and it burned in 74. Oh. Yeah. And firefighters, by the way, told me that the, the first responders to the lookout house said they knew it was arson in 30 seconds because when they went in, fire was coming up the stairway from the basement. Fires don't usually, I guess, travel up very easy, but um, they said uh, that was arson. Yeah, let's go here. Um, it, it, it seems like you really do have some very concrete um, evidence. And while presented, and you've obviously done a great deal of research. Is there any way to go under federal auspices if the state won't in any way look at this kind of corruption? Well, there, there probably is. Um, yeah, what, what I feel is, is concrete evidence uh, to some is not. I mean, there's speculation to some of this. Um, I mean, we even thought about going to the site and, and actually digging up some materials. Uh, they, we, we now know that the, the hallway, for instance, I mentioned briefly, <coughs> that was being washed down, uh, we know was, was actually being applied, uh, there was an, an accelerant being applied to that. We, we know the family of the, the people that did that. Uh, they're named in the book. Uh, but uh, with 25 years of, of wear and tear and, and erosion up there, that's not a possibility. So it's, it would be a hard fight, and I guess the big question is who's going to pay for it? Because, you know, I haven't made a dime with the book. That's all going to the historical society. So uh, it's, it's hard. And that's, again, why the one reason the state says they're not going to investigate it, because they said it would cost them millions to put together a team of researchers to really investigate it. Number one, they don't have that. Number two, the people that we name as being a part of this are all deceased now. There's no one to indict. Uh, but, you know, I've talked to so many families of the victims, and, and with one exception out of uh, you know more than a hundred, uh, they've told me they want the, the truth. Uh, they don't care if anyone's indicted. If, if it was arson, just tell us that it was arson, and, and uh, we, we'd be happy. I think there was one in the back. No? Yes, sir. Ma'am. Sorry. What was the history of uh, the uh, showing zoning the I don't recall exactly when they opened. They only had the place. Uh, they they own a, uh, I don't know how many people remember down on, on Dixie Highway and what's now Fort Wright. There was a pre the President's Motor Inn. Um, there was a, a restaurant, I can't recall the name of it now, but they owned those places. In the Hawk well, It was the Hawk House, but it was something before that that they owned. And they, they brought success to that. But somewhere 69, 70, yeah, they, they bought the lockout house. They only had that place for about about three or four years. Uh, yeah, it was empty when, during the time of the fire. They were going through remodeling, and uh, uh, which happens a lot when you're remodeling places in the park town. Uh, they got the insurance. Am I being told? Yeah, about 30 something. Okay, so we, we do have to end up. Uh, folks, I greatly appreciate it. It's been a great audience. Uh, I, uh